A couple weeks ago, we started looking at the last major section of the first book of the Bible, the story of, of Joseph. And, you know, Joseph is depicted as being this faithful son among a lot of very unfaithful brothers. And his father uh, loves Joseph. Jacob has honored him with a special robe, the robe of the firstborn, giving him preeminence in the family. But his brothers envy him. They're green with envy. And they can't, they can't even stand, they can't even give a kind word to him. They don't even like to look at him. Now, as we finish out this chapter, there's three things we especially want to notice. We want to notice how Joseph, in so many ways, points ahead to Jesus Christ and what he does for us. And we're also going to talk about the brothers and how the brothers really point to us. They, they represent fallen, sinful, the human condition. And we'll mention quickly a little bit about God's faithfulness to the believer. So go ahead and open your Bible to chapter 37 in Genesis. And the first thing we want to talk about is how Joseph really foreshadows the ministry of Jesus Christ. You know, Joseph, back in the beginning of chapter 37, we're told that Joseph was a shepherd of his father's sheep. And Jesus was also a shepherd of his father's sheep. He, he lays down his life for his father's sheep. Uh, we're told that Joseph was deeply loved by his father. And God, the father, says about his son at his baptism, John the, with John the Baptist, he said, this is my beloved son, with him I am well pleased. And then Joseph's brothers, they didn't believe him. But Joseph would say, I've had these dreams from God, and they just, they didn't even want to hear what he had to say. And in the New Testament says that even Jesus' own brothers did not believe in him. They, 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 did, they didn't have any time to believe in Jesus. His own, the own people who grew up with him said, ah, he's nobody. Joseph's brothers rejected his right to rule. They said, oh, come on. You're going to rule over us? Forget it. And John chapter 1 says that Jesus came to his own people, but his own people did not even receive him. And if you look again at, at the text in, Hebrew, in uh, chapter 37 of Genesis in verse 13, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pastoring the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So Jacob said to Joseph, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. Notice Joseph is sent by his father for, to his brothers. And Hebrews chapter 2 says that Jesus came uh, to die for our sins, and he came to his brothers, in other words, his little brothers and sisters, those who would believe on him. Jesus came looking for us. And you'll notice in verses 13 and 14, the word send. He was sent, Joseph was sent by his father, and he obeyed without question, just as Jesus obeyed his father without question. Now, in verses 15 through 17, there's this funny little blurb in the middle of the story, and you almost, when you read it, you wonder, does that even need to be here? But it serves an important purpose. And a man found him, found Joseph, wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, what are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, they've gone away. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. The, the purpose of this incident is to slow down the story so we really pay attention. It highlights Joseph's willingness to obey his father no matter what. And also in verse 16 has this very important line. I am looking for my brothers. This, this funny little exchange with a stranger draws this to our attention. And see, this is the theme of Joseph's whole life. His whole life in Genesis is he's looking for his brothers. He will seek them for years and for years until he finds them when they come and they bow down before him in Egypt. When God has made him the number two man and God through circumstances, through a famine, he'll bring them to Egypt and he stands before them. But all that time, even when Joseph was in Egypt, he was praying for his, his brothers, for the family of God, God's chosen people, the descendants of Abraham. He was praying for them. He was seeking them. And he will find his brothers when they were no longer interested in him. They were certainly not looking for him. And it's just like Jesus, because Jesus was seeking us when we were not seeking him. 
We were sinners. We were self-absorbed. We were not looking for him. Or if we were seeking for God, we were like people groping in the dark, not knowing who or what we'd even be looking for. But Jesus came looking for us, and he found us. And that's the great ministry of Jesus. He came to us when we were not interested in going to him. But you know in our story, Joseph's brothers, they plot to kill him. But see, just like Jesus, Jesus, his, his own people plotted to kill him. They rejected his message. They rejected him as God's chosen one, as the Messiah. And Joseph, you'll notice, is sold to these traveling Ishmaelites for silver. He's sold for the price of a slave. Jesus was betrayed by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. Again, it was the price of a slave. See, in God's plan, Joseph had to endure this suffering because through all this strange set of circumstances and all the suffering he's going to go through the rest of the story, it will put him in a position and in a place where he is able to save his brothers and rescue them and eventually bring all God's people down to Egypt where there's going to be food and they'll grow into a, a numerous nation. And see, Jesus had to go through what he went through for us. He had to endure the cross to save us. And now he has conquered death, and he sits at his Father's right hand in the place of the absolute highest honor. Look at the screen at Hebrews 7, verse 25. Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus, as the risen Lord who has endured the penalty for our sins on the cross, he's not in a place, he's able to save us to the uttermost, to glorify us with him one day, to share that glory, to rule, will rule a kingdom with Christ. He's able to do that for us. I don't know, now I don't read Chinese. I don't know much about Chinese. But I'm told that the character for righteousness in, in the Chinese characters is a combination of the character for me and the, and the character for lamb. And then you think if you have me and you put the character in Chinese for lamb on top of that, it forms righteousness. That's what Christ did for us. We were just me. We were, we were sinners, uh, curled in on ourselves, selfish. And then Christ came, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and through his death for us, his, his, the, his blood is applied to our life, and a new character is formed, righteousness. We become the righteousness of God. See, that was Jesus' mission. He came seeking us, and he saved us, and he did it. It's not something that we did. It's, all, it's what he has done for us that makes us God's children. Jesus is the God-man, and his shed blood re- obliterates any record of our sin anywhere. You know, when they say if you send a text or every time you type something on it, on a website, you know, that's always out there. It, it, it could go viral. It's just still, it's out there somewhere. But see, what Jesus Christ did, the, he took the, mem- or the memory of our sin, was just removed from God's memory forever. And so God looks at you and says, you are pleasing to me. You are righteous. You are the righteousness of my own son. And Jesus has been raised to the place of honor and glory at the right hand of the Father. And he is qualified like no one else. He's qualified and able to one day to come back for you. Jesus will come and remold you, reshape you into sinless perfection with all of his royal magnificence. You are a joint heir with Christ. He holds back nothing from you. It's all that Jesus came for us, the beloved of the Father, to reconcile us to God. And so Joseph really looks ahead to the work of Jesus Christ. Now the brothers here, they sort of remind us of the human condition, of, of human sinfulness. And you'll notice in this story that the emphasis in many ways is on the brothers' wickedness. And there's other texts that talk about Joseph's suffering and how he cried for mercy in the pit. But really the emphasis here is look, these brothers and what they've done. They plan to kill God's chosen one. And just so, so heartlessly, they reject his dreams, they reject his revelation from God, they say we don't want to hear it, they throw him into a pit. Now there's something funny that Moses does when he wrote this. I want to show you this. In verse 20, the, the brothers come up with a scheme, let's tell our dad that a fierce beast or a fierce animal ate Joseph. Then verse 25 says, and when, when Joseph was in the pit, they sat down to eat. It's like Moses wants us to connect the dots and say, oh, these brothers 
are like wild animals. These brothers are like beasts that will tear their brother apart. Um, they're just so, they're, they're so wicked. They, they'd kill their own brother. And what they do is they change their plans and decide they're going to sell Joseph as a slave. And they, you know, they dip Joseph's coat in goat's blood and they lie to their father. And they just, they break his heart. And notice when they go to their father, they say, look at this coat. Do you think it's your son's? They don't say, we're afraid this is our brother. They say, oh, it's, maybe this is your, your bratty son that we don't want, have want anything to do with at all. And they're so, uh, they're so callous, so, so hard-hearted. And, it, of course, Jacob imagines his son being torn to pieces. You imagine if you're a parent, it would be like the, just, just your imagination would run wild picturing what your son's been through. And in his, Joseph's, I mean, Jacob's cry of anguish in verse 35, when he says, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning, and he weeps for him. This is the low point of the whole Joseph story, because Jacob cannot be comforted, and the brothers have caused him bitter pain. I think we should take a minute and talk about what is the root of their bitterness, their, their, their hatred, their, their envy. See, the brothers hate Joseph because they envy him. Uh, they did not, see, they do not trust God to bless them in his way and his time. See, they, they're not looking to God. They're not thinking of, gee, you know, God made this promise to our great-grandfather Abraham to bless him and to make him into a great nation. And, and, and then to all the families of the earth will be blessed in his seed, in Christ. See, they're not thinking of that at all. All they can think of is, they're getting a raw deal in life because dad just does everything for Joseph and he's not very nice to us. Now, they're right. That's a fair assessment. But the problem is they have no, no faith in God at all. If they were trusting in God, then the fact that Jacob has spoiled, and he has, and favored Joseph would, have, would not have made them feel like their lives were meaningless and ruined. Now, yeah, they would hurt, yeah. And we don't want a candy coat. This, this is a troubled family. And and. and Jacob always treats his wife Leah and her kids like they're just second-class people. I mean, they would definitely have real hurt. We're not denying that. But they wouldn't need Jacob's favor the way they do. They just feel they cannot have happiness as long as Joseph's walking around with that coat. And unless their dad treats them with total equity, they just feel like they can't ever be anybody. They can't be valuable. They're bitter because they're worshiping an idol. They're worshiping the idol of their father's approval. And unless they get that equal treatment and that approval from their father, uh, they need that to feel important, to, be, to have happiness, to, to feel like they're valuable. See, the brothers think that all their discontent is coming from their circumstances. So they think if we can just get rid of Joseph and his dreams, then we'll be happy and li we'll live happily ever after. Of course, it doesn't work that way. See, th this is what the world tells us. This is the message from the sinful world around us. You know, you don't like people? Get rid of them. You know, you can change the circumstances, then life will be great. You know, get a new husband. Get a new wife. Uh, take revenge when it's helpful. Or grab center stage and elbow anybody who gets in your way. Then you'll be someone. Then you'll, you'll really be a person of importance. Uh, you know, Tom Hanks, the, the actor, he, he's quoted as saying something to this effect. If you knew what it took for me to get to the place where I am today, you wouldn't even like me. You know, if you knew the stuff I did to get ahead, uh, you wouldn't even be able to, to stand to be with me. You know, that, that just a, a competitive, competitive mean streak to get all the right parts. You know, every one of us here has worshipped idols. We, our hearts are idol factories. All of us have needed someone or something even more than we recognize we needed God. All of us have envied someone. All of us have looked at someone before and said, you know, they get all the breaks. If I had their life, oh, then things would be so much better for me. I would be more popular. I would be more successful. People would notice me more. All of us tend to blame our circumstances instead of trusting God, believing that God's got perfect timing for us in Christ. You know, all of us have betrayed someone at some time. Maybe it was in a big way. Maybe it was in a little simple, a quiet way of just not speaking up for someone when we should have. But we've all betrayed someone. We've certainly all betrayed Christ. All of us have mistreated somebody else. And 
if we think about that, we look at the brothers, we think about ourselves, and we ask, is there any good news for people who envy, people who betray others, who are cruel? Is there any good news for such people? Of course, there is. That's what, that's what the cross is about. That's what Jesus did for us. Think about all your betrayal. Every time you've ever betrayed someone, whether it was in a big way or a little way, all the times you've mistreated someone, often it's someone in your, our own family that we love the most, people we've mistreated, all that was charged to our Lord Jesus' account. All the times you've been envious of someone and not been content and not trusted God with your life, all the times, all our illicit pursuits for the so-called good life, the, the times we've been greedy or we've coveted what other people had or, or we've thought lustfully or, or pursued things in an immoral way. Every, all that, all the ways we've pursued the good life in a sinful way was all placed on Jesus and he paid the full penalty for every last bit of it, for all our actions, all our thoughts. And so that means if you put your faith in him, and most of you already have, but I remind you that you're free. Jesus cried out, it's finished, it's paid for, it's done. You are free in him. And his perfect obedience goes on your transcript. You know, if you're looking, through, God looks through your transcript in heaven. If you've put your faith in Christ, he flipped, he said, your transcript says you are absolutely perfect. You did everything always and thought everything and felt everything the way you should have, like Jesus. That's the gift that we get from Christ. In everything Jesus did in his life, it was the opposite of envy. It was the opposite of, of greed or cruelty, or the opposite of betrayal. It was loyalty. Everything he did was love, loyal love to his Father and for other people. And so Jesus, yes, is there hope for people like these brothers that disown, uh, th- th- disown their own brother, and betray? Yeah, there's hope. There's Christ. And all of us have betrayed someone. But th- there is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Now, one thing I want to mention also briefly is that God is faithful to his promise to the believer. God's made promises to Joseph. Now, look at verse 36 here in Genesis 37. It's a short verse. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. It's a very important verse because we find out that right after Joseph's life, I mean, from a human level, it's been ruined. I mean, his own brothers have betrayed him. They've sold him as a slave. He's gone to another country. I mean, his dad doesn't know where he is. It's a horrible place to be. It's a dark place. But look, God's doing something. God is faithful because he doesn't wind up just as a field slave, but in a place, in in the captain of the bodyguard's home. And that will become a springboard for God to raise him up, eventually to lead him to the palace of Pharaoh himself. There's grief back home in Hebron. You know, Jacob is unconsolable. And Joseph is the object of attempted murder and kidnapping and betrayal. It it seems, I mean, you can imagine if he feels like everyone's out to get him, it kind of seems that way. Evil seems victorious, and yet through this strange set of circumstances that God is orchestrating, he winds up in the home of the captain of the bodyguard. And you see something, it's kind of funny here. Joseph's brothers think they are getting rid of him forever and ever and ever, amen. Never have to listen to one of his dumb dreams ever again. And yet by selling him to these traveling Ishmaelites who sell him as a slave, they unwittingly become part of God's plan for Joseph to become their savior as the right-hand man to Pharaoh in, in the future. And that's just like Jesus. When they nailed Jesus to the cross, the people who nailed him to the cross said, we are finally getting rid of this troublemaker once and for all. But by nailing him to the cross, they became part of God's plan for Jesus Christ to bring us God's forgiveness by his shed blood. You might feel at times, as I do, that everything is against you. You may go through times when all circumstances are all stacked up against you. And you say, man, if if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. It seems like everything's against you. Maybe you're diagnosed with cancer. Or you can't pay the bills, or there's this weird stuff going on at work, or maybe someone in your neighborhood spreading rumors about you, and it hurts because it's so untrue. Maybe you go through hostility. Maybe someone's mad at you because you're a Christian, or just, just because someone's hostile towards you. Maybe there's things in your upbringing, in your past, that keep haunting you and troubling you, and you, you can't undo the past. But listen, if you are in Christ through faith in Him, there is nothing that can ever alter God's glorious, beautiful plans for you. Nothing that can prevent God from from bringing them to completion. You will be glorified. You will share in God's glory. And in this life, 
you get to serve God. You get to speak the good news to people. You get to pray for other people. You get to do loving things for your neighbor. And you get to do that. And, and, and God is preparing you in all things to rule with his son Jesus Christ in the age to come. And God will often use bad circumstances. And he'll even use our enemies to accomplish his plans for us. Uh, I read a little blurb about K. Arthur this week. You know, K. Arthur teaches inductive Bible study. And when she was a, a younger woman, her and her husband, maybe they had some kids at that time too, but I'm not sure. But they were on the mission field in Mexico. And then, then K. Arthur developed heart problems. And they had to come home. And she was so disappointed. And she was so upset. She said, God, I'm willing to go anywhere for you. And I get this heart condition. Now my, my, our whole family, we have to come back. All those plans seem ruined. And she felt like such a failure and depression set in. She said, until finally, she said, Father, I can't, I'm, I'm tired of fussing about this. It's your will be done. What, if, if this is what you want, then I put it in your hands because you know what's best. And she said it was several years before she would see how God used those few years she had in Mexico doing Bible study that led to her being able to produce Bible studies that would reach eventually 52 different countries. And then she says, my disappointments still aren't over. Pain and trials are almost constant companions, but now I know that my trials are not enemies. Now I, God takes my disappointments and he works everything together for good. I realize that my my disappointments drive me to the sovereign arms of God. I know that he's in control. When we feel like God is killing us or God is throwing us into a pit, because sometimes you wonder, I mean, sometimes I feel like, God, man, what are you, he's trying to do everything that you, I don't want to have happen. You're trying to turn my life upside down. See, that's when God is actually, he's rescuing us from our idols because we have these idols and that we, we believe circumstances. Our lives have to turn out a certain way. This is the script I believe in. And, and for me to be really happy, for me to really enjoy serving God, everything has to be the way I thought it was going to turn out in my fairy tale dreams. And God has to free us from putting our hope in the wrong thing, from those circumstance idols that we erect in our hearts. Uh, and then we find and that he does that so we can find freedom in Christ, the life that is found only in Christ, the real forgiveness, and the real success, if you can use that word, that goes on forever. Real position, being a place to enjoy God forever, to, be, to know we are honored as favored sons and daughters based on what Jesus did for us. Sons and daughters of the King. But God's got to free us because our, our heart latches on to the wrong things. We have to have our hope in God only. And God will use trials and sometimes some very weird circumstances to teach you that everything you've ever wanted or ever needed is really found in Jesus Christ alone. And in Christ, it's already yours. Romans 8.31 says, God, if God is for us, then who can possibly be against us? And God, if you're in Christ, God is always for you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for, for this. I mean, Joseph, Joseph's life is like a crazy roller coaster ride. It's like a nightmare. Father, we've been hurt by our brothers and sisters. We've been hurt before, Father, but not many of us had brothers that sold us as slaves to ship us out. But, Father, in all that, you were doing something beautiful and good. You were, you were raising Joseph to a place in all that suffering where he could save the people of God. And, and Jesus and his suffering was all for us, that we could be reunited with God forever and ever. We thank you for that. Help us to trust you now, because some of us are going through a really hard time. Some of us feel like our dreams have just been shattered. Like the, or the thing, the one thing in life we always said, I can handle anything, but please don't let this one thing happen, God, and that one thing has just happened. The thing we were most afraid of or most dreaded. Or just, it just seems like stuff in our family, or stuff where we thought we were going with our, our work, it just, just, just turned out all funny, all different, and it hurts. Father, help us to trust you.